because I take it easy and make a commitment with my higher power to do the best I can, I know I will be taken care of today. I've come to believe in miracles for I am one. In search of a friend 99. In search of a friend. I turned on with marijuana four years ago. I was 35 years old and had a very responsible job as office manager for a small firm. I was a workaholic and spent long hours and weekends at my job. I was always tired and did not have a social life, other than sporadic one-night stands that never developed into any deeper relationships. I felt martyred and overworked. I'd avoided street drugs even though my family had used them sporadically. They were illegal, and I was a law-abiding law. -abiding law. I had a few long-term encounters with prescription drugs, downers, painkillers, and weight loss pills in the past. I never had a problem with them, because they were legal. In 1977, the possession of marijuana was considered a misdemeanor in Oregon, and many of my friends were getting high. I began spending weekends playing pinball for hours to relax with a friend who smoked pot regularly. We'd sit in the car while he got loaded, then play pinball till he came down. We'd return to the car, and he'd smoke another joint. After a few months of weekends, I began encouraging him to smoke more often, because it made my pinball stroke better. After several months of my contact highs, I finally smoked my first joint and loved it. Within six weeks, I was buying $75 to $100 worth of marijuana a week. At first, I only smoked after work, to relax. I needed something special, because I worked such long hours. I smoked every night, then from Friday night till the wee hours Sunday night. Soon I found being loaded helped my attitude while driving in freeway traffic. I felt so mellow, so I began smoking on the way to work in the morning. My lifestyle had suddenly changed. Everything seemed to be moving faster than I could handle. I became very emotional and felt a sense of panic because I couldn't assimilate all the vivid new perceptions Todd was showing me. I needed time to sit back and sort everything out. 99. 100 Narcotics Anonymous Within 10 months of my first joint, I'd quit my job, sold all my furniture, and was living out of my car. I lived on unemployment benefits for a while until they ran out and then I took a waitress job. I was unable to cope with any job that required concentration. I moved in with my sister and her children. Quite often there wasn't enough money to pay the rent, but I always had pots. I began feeling despair and depression daily. I needed to get loaded to face each day. A little over two years ago, some friends took me to another 12-step program to deal with my weight problem. During this long depression, I gained almost 100 pounds. I began attending these meetings regularly, always loaded. I hated meetings, but had nowhere else to go. Quite often I'd fall asleep there and wake up as the meeting ended and people were leaving. I went to a marathon of this other 12-step program last summer, and spent most of the time alone in the woods, getting loaded. However, I did ask a sponsor to read my 4th step inventory so I could complete step 5. After reading my pages and pages of rambling inventory, I'd always been loaded when I wrote, she very gently suggested that I might want to take a look at my pot smoking sometime. 
The marijuana didn't seem to be getting me high anymore, so about a month later I tried to quit. I couldn't. I would try to go just one day without moving, but would find myself pacing the floor unable to focus my concentration on anything else but hot. I thought I was going to go insane. I couldn't get high, but it hurt too much to stop smoking dope. I began looking for another connection who could supply me with something that would work for me. One night at a meeting of this other 12-step program, I'd listened to several people sharing their experience, strength, and hope. I stood up when it was my turn and began to cry. I couldn't look those people in the eye. I felt like a hypocrite. The rigorous honesty of the program had me. I told them that I was loaded and had been at every meeting and function that I'd attended. I felt like a thief. Several people put their arms around me and said keep coming back. I found a piece of paper in my hand with the phone number of Narcotics Anonymous and the names of several people who had been clean for a long time. I went to my first NA meeting the next night, terrified. I knew I wasn't a junkie, but I was hurting so badly I thought I might hear something that could help me to stop smoking any more dope. In search of a friend 101. A tall, blonde woman welcomed me and gave me a cup of coffee. I was so nervous and uncomfortable. I smoked a joint before leaving for a meeting, but it had not worked, and my jaws ached from clenching my teeth. She sat next to me and told me she stopped shooting heroin three years ago. She showed me ulcer scars on her legs, then introduced me to another woman who had a problem with marijuana and would be celebrating her first year clean in two weeks. I cried all through the meeting. I felt such a sense of grief and loss, but this pot had become my lover and husband, mother and father and best friend. And it wouldn't work anymore. After the meeting, these two women took me out for coffee, gave me their phone numbers and told me to call them. They suggested I attend 90 meetings in my first 90 days. I couldn't imagine how I could find the time to do that, but after the first three weeks of attending only one or two meetings a week and not smoking dope between meetings, I found the time. It was too uncomfortable when I was alone without dope. In the meetings, I heard things that kept me clean and hoping for peace till the next meeting. I soon got a sponsor, because I couldn't do it alone. I needed someone who could answer questions and reassure me that I could live without using drugs of any kind. That was a giant step for me to reach out to someone and admit that I needed support. And learning to trust another human being was a second giant step. I talked to her several times a week. More importantly, I listen to her, I respect her, because she's been where I've been, and she's clean today. She helps me work the steps of the program and she cares about my life. Through N.A., I've come to understand that I was an addict long before I ever used drugs. And I will be an addict as long as I live. But if I stay clean today from all mind-altering chemicals, I have a chance for a life of quality. Before N.A. found me, I felt something crucial to my survival missing in my life. As though at birth, Every child had been issued a book of instructions on how to live, except me. My life was spent in quiet desperation, trying to figure out on my own how to do it. Today, through N.A. and my higher power, I've got my instructions, the 12 steps in the program.
100 T Narcotics Anonymous. I was unique. I had nowhere to turn, I felt that no one could help me, as my situation was so much different from others. I thought that I was doomed to con. Continue in an insane drive towards self-destruction that had already sapped me of any determination to fight. I thought that I was unique until I found the fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. Since that day, my life has a new meaning and a new direction. I came from a white, middle-class background where success was almost assumed. I excelled academically and went on to medical school in California and in Scotland. I looked with smug disdain on my schoolmates who were experimenting with drugs. I felt that I was too good and too smart for that. I thought that a drug addict was a weak-willed, kindless creature who must have no purpose in life or sense of worth. I would not, or could not fall into that trap, as I was an achiever, winning at the game of life, and felt to have such great potential. Sometime after having started my internship at a prestigious West Coast hospital, I had my first experience with narcotics. Call it curiosity, I thought, but perhaps I was looking for something better. I was amazed at the way patients in severe pain would relax when a small amount of morphine was injected into their veins. That was for me, over the next few months. Several personal tragedies led to my world crumbling about me. Experimentation quickly led to abuse and then addiction with all the bewildering helplessness and self-condemnation that only the drug addict knows. Shortly after starting my residency training in neurosurgery, I sought help from a psychiatrist, as the delusion that I could control my narcotic use finally evaporated. I was hospitalized in a mental institution for a few days until I felt better, and then convinced my psychiatrist that I was well enough to return to my training program. He was either naive, gullible, or ignorant of drug addiction and let me go merrily on my way. I lasted a few months before relapsing. With no changes made in my thinking or behavior, relapse followed relapse, and I established a pattern that I would. 102. I was unique 103. Maintained for almost 10 years. I continued to try psychiatrists and mental institutions, five hospitalizations, but after each I would relapse again. After having performed over 100 surgical procedures while loaded, I was asked to leave my residency. Another hospitalization followed and I returned to my pattern of relapse. Besides institutionalization, over the years I have tried job changes, geographical relocation, self-help books, methadone programs, only using on the weekends, switching to pills, marriage, health spas, diet, exercise, and religion. None of them worked, other than temporarily. I was told that I was incorrigible and that there was no hope for me based upon my track record. After about five years of heavy using, I started to develop a physical allergy to my drug of choice. Insidiously at first, but progressively, each time I used, a small amount of tissue would die around the injection site. This soon led to open sores and draining wounds. I found that I could prevent the process by using cortisone initially, but after several more years it returned in spite of the cortisone. In the meantime, I developed all the attendant side effects of the cortisone, e.g., obesity, acne, ulcers, and propensity toward infection as my immune mechanism was knocked out. 
By the time I reached my last hospitalization, I had a large open wound in the left forearm with exposed infected bones. I had destroyed several tendons so that I could not raise my wrist, and the scar tissue prevented me from extending my forearm. On admission, I was very heavy and my hands and feet were swollen and full of fluid. I must have been a sight to behold as I was a physical wreck. Worse yet, I was totally demoralized and suffering from a spiritual bankruptcy of which I was unaware. The denial and self-deception were so great that I hated to see what a pitiful creature I had become. I entered a chemical abuse treatment facility in San Diego. There, for the first time, I was confronted by physicians who were addicts themselves. They asked me first if I wanted help, and then if I was willing to go to any lengths to recover. They explained that I might have to lose all my worldly possessions, my practice, my profession, my wife and family, even my arm. At first I boxed. I figured there was nothing wrong with me that a little rest and relaxation could not set right. But instead, I made a pact with them. I would listen and take orders without questioning. I had always been independent and this was certainly a change for me. This was my first introduction to the tough love that has helped me so much in NA. During that month in the hospital, a great change came over me. I was forced to go to outside NA meetings. At first, I was rebellious. These 104 Narcotics Anonymous People were not like me, they were common street people, junkies, ill teens, pillheads, and coke freaks. How could I relate to them? They did not come from my background. They had not experienced what I had experienced. They had not achieved what I had achieved. Yet when I listened, I heard my story, again and again. These people experienced the same feelings, the sense of loss, doom and degradation as I did. They too had been helpless, hopeless, and beaten down by the same hideous monster as I had. Yet they could laugh about their past and speak about the future in positive terms. There seemed such a balance of seriousness and levity with an overpowering sense of serenity, that I ate for what they had. I heard about honesty, tolerance, acceptance, joy, freedom, courage, willingness, love and humility. But the greatest thing I heard about was God. I had no problem with the concept of God, as I had called myself a believer. I just could not understand why he had let me down. I had been praying to God as a child asked Santa Claus for gifts, yet I still held on to my self-will. Without it, I reasoned, I would have no control over my life, and could not survive. It was pointed out to me that perhaps that was the whole problem. I was told that perhaps I should seek God's will first, and then conform my will to His. Today, I pray only for His will for me and the power to carry it out on a daily basis, and all is well. I have found that His gifts are without number when I consistently turn my will and my life over to His care. I have found a new home in the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. My life again has meaning. I have found that I have but one calling in life and that is to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. I am so grateful to God and N.A. that I may do this today. I have found that you are just like me. I am no longer better than or less than. I feel a real love and camaraderie in the N.A. Fellowship. My great spiritual awakening has been that I am an ordinary addict. 
I am not unique. There are still those who refuse to join us and take the path that we have chosen, because they feel that they are unique. They may die, but may God bless them too. I found a home 105. I found a home. From the time I was a little girl, I can remember feeling like I didn't quite belong. I thought I must be an alien from another planet. It seemed that I always said and did the wrong things at the wrong time. I felt a big empty hole inside of me, and I spent the next 20 years trying to fill it. I always wanted desperately to fit in somewhere. I always seemed to feel better being one of the guys, so I usually just stayed around men. I didn't really understand or trust girls. I had a very low self-image. I realize now that I hated myself. I wished I could be somebody, anybody, other than me. I felt like a loser and, looking back on it, that's probably why everybody treated me like one. I was a victim by choice, but I didn't know it. The first drug I ever used was vodka, after which I blacked out, and then passed out. The first time I smoked marijuana was the same way. I had heard marijuana didn't do much, so I smoked four joints in a row just to make sure. It worked. It didn't take long for me to find harder drugs and start using them. I was afraid of a lot of things, but trying out new drugs wasn't one of them. More and more I now started to depend heavily on drugs to make me feel better, or at least different. I guess that I wanted to get loaded and stay that way forever. The longer I got loaded, the more it seemed people were getting in my way. After a while it seemed everybody was against me. I decided people were my problem, and I didn't want anything to do with them. I thought I needed money to be free of my problems, so I went to work. I was 15 and was determined to make enough money, so I wouldn't need anybody ever. I could just get loaded and stay that way with no one to hassle me. During the time I was getting loaded, I tried a lot of different lifestyles hoping to fit in somewhere. I went to San Francisco to become an intellectual, cooking espresso and reading poetry. I tried to be a hippie, an earth. 105. 106 Narcotics Anonymous. Mama, a river rat and a desert bunny. I spent a while driving around in Cadillacs with lawyers and stockbrokers. No matter where I went or the company that I kept, I was loaded, and I was still me. Nothing seemed to fit, and I always ended up alone. I drank, dropped, snorted, smoked, and sniffed my way through the next seven years until something terrifying began to happen. I could take more and more and more drugs but I would pass out before I ever got that good feeling. I guess that the feelings which I had always run from could not be pushed down any longer. They were eating me alive. I tried and tried to use more to get that good feeling back, but all I got was more and more afraid. I didn't know what was happening to me. I couldn't turn my head off. I became more and more afraid of people until I was just living like a hermit. I felt a lot of humiliation and degradation during my addiction. I did a lot of things loaded which I am grateful that I don't have to do today. In the last few years, before I got to Narcotics Anonymous, I really believed I was going insane. I was intent on self-destruction. I tried suicide many times. In desperation, I went to a psychiatrist. 
Usually they can be a little help to addicts, but this man, thank God, knew about this program. He said, I can't help you, you're an addict. I was shocked. I had always thought drugs were the answer, not the problem. Didn't everybody take drugs? Drugs were my life. I didn't know how to give them up. He told me about a hospital where I could get help. I could no longer work or care for myself. I knew that I was crazy. I was physically, emotionally and spiritually empty, and I was very, very scared. At my first Narcotics Anonymous meeting, I knew that I had come home. I had finally found people who were just like myself. I was still scared of everyone, but somehow I knew that this was my last chance of life. If I couldn't make it here, it would be the end for me. Three times I had 89 days clean, only to use again. My disease was more powerful than I had ever imagined. What scared me is that now I really wanted to stop, but found I could not. Finally, I realized I was still trying to do it alone. I could not stay clean without these people. They had something that I desperately wanted. I had heard that if I put as much into the program as I did into using then I could make it. I found a home 107. I got closer to the program and got a sponsor and called her every day. I went to meetings every night, started to work the steps, and just hung on. Through the grace of God I have not taken a fix, pill or drink for five years. Desperation drove me to Narcotics Anonymous, and desperation is what has kept me coming back. I am grateful for the bottom that I finally hit, because it gave me the willingness to work the steps, go to meetings, and just, live one day at a time. I used to wonder, what am I going to do if I don't get loaded? Today it seems like there aren't enough hours in the day. I have real friends today, including girlfriends, and they are very special to me. The program is my life today. All the pain that I felt during my using led me to more pain, but every ounce of pain that I experienced in the program, Staying clean, brings me more growth, and more peace. The only way that the empty place inside me can be filled is through the steps of this program. The things that I have learned since coming here would fill this book. I did not know how to live, and the program is teaching me for the first time. I am finally facing the old enemy, me. I am learning to accept myself, and even to like myself, a day at a time. I know today I need the people in Narcotics Anonymous, the ones who were here before me, and those who have come in after me. I don't feel that I can ever fully repay what this program has given me, because it gave me my life. Thank you NA for being there. 108 Narcotics Anonymous. If you want what we have. My name is Bill, and I'm a junkie and a juicer. For many years of my life, I felt that the world had dealt me a cruel hand, which left me with many inadequate feelings. Fear ate a hole in me that I was never able to fill with drugs and alcohol. I was born in Alabama in 1933. My father's job required constant moving, which meant new clothes and new faces. I was small and sickly and my insecurities and inadequacies around people increased. I fought these feelings verbally and with my fists. Punishment in some fashion followed me everywhere. 
My father died when I was seven, and I remember the hate that I felt because he had left an only child to fend for himself. A grandmother, aunt and mother spoiled me rotten. Every time the church door was open, I was there.